I worked out pretty early on how to treat COVID, acute COVID. Throughout the whole thing, I have not stopped smiling because you vindicated something that I've been saying for so long. I found that it um, it wasn't quite all I thought it was going to be. It's not just about sorting out their symptoms now, but I'm interested in their giving them good health for the future, you know, investing in their future. I'm going to get started then. Tina, thank you so much for coming today. You cannot believe how... One, excited I was this morning when I got up and how excited I've been for the whole week in preparation for this. He's not lying. He's your biggest fan. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's very sweet, Tilly. Well, it's a great privilege to be here. Lovely to see your studio (laughs) and your offices and to meet Tracy. Yes, in person. (laughs) Fantastic. Yes. No, it's lovely. Thank you. To give everyone a bit of background, I met you on the 19th of December in 2016. That's how long I've known you. Goodness me. I've got the exact, I literally pulled up my calendar and I was like, I wonder how long I've known Tina for. And I pulled up the exact date when we first met you in, the, I think it was a hospital. I can't remember if it was a, or a surgery that you were working at the time. Was it? Where would it have been? Um, it wouldn't have been at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, would it? No, it was no. in Surrey somewhere. I can't remember. In Surrey. Hmm. Catrum at North Downs Hospital. Oh, North Downs Hospital, yes. There you Gosh, go. I'd forgotten I used to work there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So North yeah, Downs, yeah. That's where I actually first met you. And I, we did a recording about, I think, about a year ago now when we last yes. did our video recording. We talked a lot about MCAS and histamine. Mm-hmm. And then when that recording went out, everyone was like, Dilly, Tina is the lady for menopause please can you talk about (laughs) menopause with her and I was like you know what I have to ask her and just see what we can do and the feedback from people were like can you ask her this can you ask her this can you ask her this and I was like wow after about 400 pages of questions (laughs) we narrowed it we narrowed it down (laughs) wow well women are generally very interested in the menopause and so are men actually because yes. usually it affects them too, doesn't it? It really does. <laughs> yeah. So it's very important, I, I think, for men to understand exactly all about it as well. It, a good place kind of like, you know, people that know you know your background in the menopause, mm-hmm. histamine, MCAS and long COVID area, which has been mm-hmm. fascinating for so many people. But I think, can we get a little bit more background on the clinics that you're running and you're you're a part of and working part of? Oh, well, I I started um, training as a GP. That's where I started my career in medicine. And I thought I wanted to be a GP and I could work work part time and have children and that would fit nicely. And so I did my GP training and I worked in general practice part time for seven years whilst I had my three children. And I found that it um, it wasn't quite all I thought it was going to be. Um, and I found it quite dissatisfying because you only had seven, ten minutes with each patient. And I felt like I was just pushing drugs, writing prescriptions, or that was the pressure from the patients. They wanted to come in, get a prescription, go away with that. And I don't like writing prescriptions and drugs um, unnecessarily and um, and I also like to think about what's causing the condition in the first place and maybe we should be looking at treating that and that's not how I was taught in allopathic medicine um, and I also felt that um, I was just putting sticking plasters over things rather than dealing with the root, root cause and a lot of the patients were coming because they were in unhappy marriages they didn't have enough money Uh, So they had a lot of pressure on them. They were in in horrible jobs. They had horrible housing. And there was nothing I could do about those issues. So it wasn't very satisfying to work in that area for me. And I really admire GPs who can do it because it's a very stressful job. Um, And, you know, to be a good GP is is amazing. And then I was asked if I would... um, couldn't run the, the contraceptive services for East Surrey. And I'd, all, I'd been developing an interest in women's health uh, within general practice. And so it was a very easy decision for me to do that. Um, and I loved that. And I was, I was then invited to run Mid-Surrey and then the whole of Surrey for contraception. So I did that for 24 years. 
And we had, you know, developed teams and did teaching and speaking to young people and developing the services. And it was just great fun. I loved it. And then um, things changed. The landscape changed. They, um, the Surrey County Council took £2 million out of our £6 million budget. And on one day, they closed 36 weekly contraception clinics. And um, we went from 20 sites to three in the whole of Surrey. And so everything I had been building up and developing over 23 years just went <laughs> overnight, wow. which was really distressing for everybody, for the patients, for the staff, for me. Um, and then um, at the same time, I was developing an interest in um, the other end of women's reproductive health in the menopause. And I was working at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital um, and being a, a trainee as a, to, to train as a menopause specialist. Um, and then I was sort of going more and more into private practice, really, and I gave up the NHS when my my services were just crumbling, basically. Mm. Um, and um, so that was that was great. But in the alongside that, in 2016, my Jessie, my youngest daughter, became very very unwell, and we couldn't find anyone to help her. <laughs> And no one seemed to know what was going on with her. I didn't know what was going on with her. And I was searching, searching, trying to learn. And I stumbled across um, a diagnosis of histamine intolerance for her and mast cell activation. And then trying to find somebody who could help us was like trying to find a needle in a haystack, literally. Uh, we saw six different professors and top doctors in their fields and nobody had a clue. Um, and then I finally found uh, Dr. Professor Vic Kular at St. Mary's Paddington, who is an amazing man. Um, and he is a urogynecologist mm. and he understood mast cell activation and histamine intolerance. And the reason was he was seeing it in his women that he was treating for interstitial cystitis. And uh, so 80% of people with MCAS are female, 80% have hypermobility, 30% um, have interstitial cystitis, and that was the group he was seeing. So he pulled a lot of this together, and he was marvellous and helped us to get Jessie better. And of course, once you start learning about something, you can't unlearn it, and then you start seeing it everywhere. It's like being a pregnant woman. You don't notice pregnant people until you're pregnant, and then you see them everywhere, don't you? Mm. Um, and uh, so I started um, in my family planning clinics then in 2016, when I was asking people for a history to work out which contraceptives they could safely take and I could offer them, um, I would ask them their history and they'd tell me that they had IBS, they had some chronic fatigue, they had chronic migraine, they had funny hives and skin conditions and things. And I'd go, oh, I think I might know what you have. Um, I think you might have mast cell activation and histamine intolerance. And I'd be all like, oh, clever me, and they'd burst into tears. And oh, wow. I'd be like, oh, and they'd say, you're the first doctor that's been interested in all these symptoms and asking me about them. And you're the only one who's actually pulled it together and told me you might know what I've got, which gives me huge hope that I might get better, you know. And I say, yes, I think we can help you improve. And and that's when my journey started, really, getting experience and learning how to advise and help these patients. And then they would come back and say, I feel so much better. It's fantastic. And it'd be like, yes, and we'd all both dance around the, <laughs> around the clinic room. And then, you know, it was just it was just really, really rewarding, really rewarding. So that um, meant that patients were searching me out for then mast cell activation, not just menopause in my private clinic. And then along came COVID, uh, which was interesting, to say the least. And um, I worked out pretty early on how to treat COVID, acute COVID, because it bore a huge resemblance to the, the patients who were getting into difficulty with acute COVID seemed to be the ones who had mast cell activation. Mm. And therefore, treating the mast cell activation treated the overreaction of their immune system to the COVID and made them better. And, uh, and then I heard about long COVID in the August of 2020. Mm. And I started to think, oh, my gosh, I think these pe people have got post-viral fatigue, ME, MCAS, you know, type thing, I really should try and help them because all the, everything in the news was, we don't know what's happening, doctors don't know what, haven't got a clue, um, no, no one's helping these patients and everything. And I thought, oh, 
I think I have to help them. <laughs> so I went on to um, BBC Look East, mm. um, a very nice um, a reporter from the BBC contacted me, actually, and she alerted me to the long COVID story more. She said, I heard a podcast you did with Liz Earl, I think she said, and mm-hmm. you were talking about muscle activation. She said, I think I've got it. Um, but she said, I think I've got long COVID now. And she she sort of linked the two. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. Let's talk about it. And uh, she got me onto the TV um, in October 2020. Mm-hmm. And I said, um, if people with long COVID could download a free app uh, called the People With App, um, and um, then and put in their profile of all their symptoms, I could see if it looks very similar, or if it looks like the same for MCAS. And two thousand two hundred people did in about 30, 48 hours. I mean, it was incredible. Wow, seventy two hours, and there was all this data. We had all this data. It was all anonymized and everything. Um, and this marvelous um, chap, uh, Mark. Oh, gosh, what's his surname? Mark. Mark, Mark. Uh, from People With, um, offered, you know, the People With app for, for free to do this work. And we looked at all the data and the profile was exactly the same as mast cell activation. So then I thought, right, OK, so I know how to potentially help these people. And I was curious to see, did these patients have mast cell activation before they got COVID? So was it exacerbated by the COVID or had... COVID caused it and it actually made their immune system become, you know, hypervigilant and, and overreactive. Um, and I also felt morally obliged because I thought I know how to help these people and I couldn't bear reading about how they were languishing on their sofas and nobody mm. was helping them. So on the 1st of November 2020, I opened my long COVID clinic and it was only half a day a week. So I saw five patients a week, gave them an hour each and um, and within 36 hours it was fully booked for six months that was was, the demand was so huge and I hadn't even advertised it anywhere but just must have mentioned it to somebody (laughs) anyway it was fully booked it was great why I'm just not surprised by the way like not even surprised at all by that no no so it was amazing and then then of course I started my work because then I could talk to them I could take their history and see uh, what was happening and I would say 99% of them had previously undiagnosed untreated mast cell activation um, and giving them the treatment therefore for mast cell activation sorted out their long COVID and people got better mostly pretty quickly um, but it's not a it's not a quick fix in no. some people, and it's you know um, they've been struggling with their mast cells for many years, and um, so it takes quite a long time to unpick all of it and calm them down and you know re- um, sort out their microbiome and sort out some of the triggers like Lyme's disease and uh, mycotoxins from mold and things and detoxify them as well as um, giving them relief from their symptoms. So, yeah, so that was that. And now, uh, then I found that I was so busy, so many people wanting appointments. I had to stop taking new patients because I needed appointments to see follow-ups, you know. And um, I felt really sad every time I got emails that used to break my heart. And I think, I need to just open more clinics. Um, And then some other doctors approached me and said, could they work with me? Uh, which was fantastic. Could they learn what I was doing and could they work with me? So I took on a few doctors so that we could offer more appointments. So that's what's happened. So I've got this great team of lovely doctors who are just amazing. And they they teach me much more than I teach them, actually. They're, a lot of them have got functional medicine backgrounds and, you know, or doing courses in functional medicine and stuff, which I've never done. And I've just had to sort of learn it by osmosis. Um, mm. And, uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting journey. Really interesting journey. And so, yeah, I've got these great, lovely people I would never have met before. I've had some, um, I've had a lot of people who have like come to us through you or vice versa. And they say really nice things about your, about the team that have people that you've got. Because whenever I think about your clinic, I always think, and by the way, we'll link all the clinics in the description. So if anyone wants to find out a bit more about the clinics, you can go on into these websites. But I was chuckling because so many people, um, would like go to you and they'd give really good feedback, which was actually really nice here. But can I just say for anyone listening on audio, throughout the whole thing, I have not stopped smiling because 
you vindicated something that I've been saying for so long, the overactive immune system. Mm -hmm. And that for me is whenever me and T have done any of our conversations and talked, this is something that no one's talking about. Mm -hmm. No one's talking about the fact that long COVID mass activation syndrome is linked with an overactive immune system mm -hmm. and balancing the immune system is the key to actually bringing that bring that into balance totally and when you when you said it then i was just like yes <laughs> tina thank you so much and this is why i wanted you on literally the whole episode's done now we're okay. doing we're, we're <laughs> <done. laughs> we okay. but yeah. that link that you found and how you're bringing the immune system into balance has been literally the key to have so many patient success stories mm. Am, am I wrong or am I right no, there? No, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And the immune system is very delicate. Um, and unfortunately, 30, 17 to 20% of the population are estimated to have a, an overreactive immune system. And that's mast cell activation syndrome. And it's genetic. It tends to run in families. Um, it can also be epigenetic, mm. uh, where outside influences in the environment can make it worse. But um, so we've got this population and, and the person who's done the, the most work on this is um, a Professor Molderings at Bonn University. And he's such an expert at this. He's like the global expert, really. And he's identified that it's 17 to 20 percent of the population in Germany. And I suspect that's the same everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly been my experience with patients here. Um, and so this overreactive immune system is just waiting to misbehave, basically, from birth. So these poor patients, they often get lots of tons, you know, lots of tonsillitis, lots of eczema um, as a baby, asthma. Um, they overreact to insect bites, and sometimes, uh, sadly, a lot of them have a history of childhood trauma, um, and that will stimulate their immune system too. So it's it's not it's you know we are. We are physical, mental, and spiritual beings, aren't we? And an assault on all of those things will affect our immune system. And the, um, the fight or flight then becomes too reactive and wants to protect this poor little person. And so it just overreacts to everything then. So then we get people who are sensitive to perfumes. I have one dear, lovely patient I saw this week, and uh, she had... We'd worked really hard and she'd worked incredibly hard to get her system as stable as possible. And she was desperate to go on holiday. She said, I know it's going to be challenging because, you know, as soon as you walk into that duty free, they're spraying perfumes everywhere, aren't they? You know, ooh. and now they've started spraying insecticides in the airplane. You're sitting there and they go through the through the cabin. I did not realize what? that. Oh, Yes. We just went to Sardinia and then to um, Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. And on both of the flights, going and coming back, they walked through, the cabin crew walked through with with aerosol spray. And, and luckily, I'd given this patient a letter. And in it, I had explained about her sensitivities and that she could have an anaphylactic reaction because she has had in the past to anything like that. And they agreed not to spray her, not to, not to spray the cabin. Which was really good because she was she would have been she would have had to get off the flight and not gone on holiday, you know, and then so she'd taken all these precautions, bless her heart, and um, and then when um, it, and she had she actually bought herself a sort of very fancy mask proper proper mask that was, so she could walk through duty free mm -hmm. or oh, she actually said at Gatwick there's a door you can go upstairs and and avoid duty free. I did not know oh, that. I, I didn't know. know that either. That's I know there's the, the uh, walk of shame if you miss your flight and then you have to go <laughs> back out of security. There's like a separate exit. I yes, wonder if it's, yes. if it's that. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently she said there is a door you can go upstairs or something and then you can avoid the um, the duty free and you can come down, I presume, into the into the um Departures Lounge. Mm -hmm. For anyone, anyone listening, but, yeah, it's a trick yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's worth asking for sure. If yes, and, and the letter made a difference because she, they, they did not spray the cabin because they said, oh, we couldn't possibly take a risk of giving you an anaphylactic shock sitting in our, in our, our airplane, so we won't spray, we won't take the risk. 
so that was good you know what's interesting because when we did our last recording you said you said to me you were like uh, i'm gonna i'm I'm, apologize if i misquote you you said a lot of the women who had menopause had an underlying diagnosis around night we said like 90 percent or 99 percent of them had an underlying um, sorry, undiagnosed link of having mcas so no that's not quite right okay so, apologies it's okay it's okay uh if i said that that was wrong no, 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 i'm just misquoted i'm just no. misquoted completely no. i don't remember the interview now so i'm just trying no, no. to drag so my on it. if you imagine um 20 percent of the population have got mast cell activation which is a lot but 80% of them are female. So it's more than 20% of females have, have mast cell activation. And so when they right? go into menopause. So when yeah. they go into the menopause, they mm. have particular difficulties because of the relationship between estrogen and histamine. Wow. And um, because estrogen and histamine have, and, and our sex hormones actually have a very complex and complicated relationship. Um, and the um, so when women go into the perimenopause, one of the things that happens is their estrogen levels go really sky high and then they drop down and then they're fluctuating minute to minute, um, which is what causes a lot of the hot flushes and the symptoms. The body doesn't like fluctuations. It likes to know where it is. Right. But it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. And that will affect their histamine <laughs> because it will, you know, mast cells um, affect uh, estrogen and estrogen affects mast cells. And so you've got this sort of um, relationship between the two. And so if you've got somebody who's got mast cell activation syndrome, when their estrogen is misbehaving and going up and down and cr- is crazy, that's going to give them releases of histamine that are crazy as well. And that will give them terrible histaminic symptoms and mast cell symptoms. Um, The problem for the poor women is they don't know which is which. And a lot of the symptoms look the same. So hot flushes, palpitations, um, insomnia, (laughs) uh, you know, low blood pressure, high blood pressure. All of these things are happening in the perimenopause to somebody who doesn't have mast cell activation. But then when you've got mast cells as well, what what is causing what you know which is it so usually the problem then lies when these patients go to their doctor and say i've got all these menopausal symptoms please can i have some help and the doctors say yes let's give you some hrt that's not necessarily going to make them feel better mm. because giving them the estrogen is going to trigger some more histamine release and will make their histaminic symptoms worse it might help some of the menopause symptoms but and then it becomes a bit of a blur and they'll go back and say I don't feel any better in fact I feel a bit worse and so the doctors will say ah we haven't given you enough we better give you some more estrogen so they give them more estrogen patient goes away they get worse because it's aggravating their mast cells and they come back and they say I'm worse and they say oh you're not absorbing it very well we must give you more (laughs) and this is this is what I come across very frequently or the poor woman gives up altogether she says I can't take this HRT this is just making me ill it's hopeless I'm I'm done I can't do it and that's a real shame too because we know that women who go on HRT are fitter and healthier um, and uh, you know, do better than women who are not on HRT. So they shouldn't be deprived their HRT just because they've got mast cell activation. Um, so in my experience, what we have to do is when we take a history about from the patient before we give them any HRT at all, we have to assess: is there any mast cell activity going on here? Is there a history of mast cell activation syndrome? If there isn't, you're good to go with the HRT. It's all menopause, absolutely fine. Just And the, the earlier they start a little bit of hormone replacement in the early perimenopause, the better. There's no need to struggle for years mm-hmm. um, and, you know, just think it's your time of life as in you're stressed at work and family stresses and things. It's, it's important to get proper advice and help. But if there are things in their history that really indicate that they are, are a patient who's suffered with mast cell activation, and often 
people consider themselves to be very healthy. They are very healthy. They have MCAS, but they're very healthy. But they might say, oh, it's just me. I have a little bit of IBS occasionally. You know, there's certain foods I can't tolerate. Um, and I had eczema as a baby. And um, and when I get an insect bite, whew, my leg swells up, you know. Um, and But that's just me. And they are healthy. And they've been coping and managing with this. But when you get that in the history... I know that what we have to do is address the mast cells first. Mm -hmm. We have to bring that down, calm that down, and then cautiously start the HRT. Because I know that if I just go straight in with estrogen, I'm going to make the MCAS worse. So what you're saying is that as doing what you're doing, spending longer than 10 minutes with someone mm -hmm. and actually getting their history first... Yeah is a much better approach. Weird that, isn't it? That that, that would work as a function. Know, that so, sorry for the sarcasm, <laughs> but like, it literally is just asking someone a little yeah. bit more of a yeah. question and asking more about it. So before you even prescribe the HRT, I've got to ask, why the hell is this movement of more is more is more? Because Trace said it earlier to us as well about this idea that like we've got this allopathic medicine has got this idea that if it doesn't work the first time, we should add more. What What is this drive with HRT? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder as well if it's a little bit in terms of, you know, if menopause, as you were mentioning, you know, they aren't looking for the MCAS. So if no. menopause is the diagnosis, this is the treatment. And if the treatment isn't working, we need to you give need to increase more. more. Yeah. And if you had a patient who, a, a lady who is no, no MCAS at all, okay, so mm. she's just a, a um, standard going through the perimenopause that might be right mm, it mm -hmm. might be right to increase the dose and we do have patients um, some patients don't absorb very well now usually when we go on to HRT we like to do transdermal first because it doesn't increase the risk of clotting oral does oral increases the clotting factors temporarily a little bit for the first nine months that they're on it and then it resets to normal. Now, if somebody is slim and fit and healthy, they have a very tiny risk of clotting and you're going to increase that tiny risk by a tiny amount. So, you know, that's not an issue. But generally we try and go transdermally because we don't increase the clotting risk at all. And um, so we use gels or a patch. And um, sometimes with women, you give them the transdermal and it doesn't make that much difference um, and you increase the dose a little bit and it doesn't make that much difference. You think, are they actually absorbing it? So if you do a blood test, you can see, uh, are they achieving any estradiol in their blood at all? And sometimes for a dose that should be giving three, 400 picomoles per litre, you're guessing 88 and you think okay they're not absorbing <laughs> do you know why that is no we it don't is. yeah they okay we don't know why some some and some will absorb well to begin with for a couple of years and then suddenly they lose their ability to absorb i don't know what's going on there um but that's why at least once a year i like to know what my patients blood levels are mm. um, and there's quite a lot of pushback from some GPs on that they say well, no we've been told by the British Menopause Society that we don't need to do that well I would argue and Professor Nick Panay who I work with in Harley Street or he's now moved to one Welbeck Street um, he would argue we do need to know because you can't tell if, if, if somebody's not absorbing it and you're not giving enough just like <clears throat> excuse me you can't tell if their level's gone too high there's something called tachyphylaxis. If the estradiol level goes over 1,000 picomoles per litre, it floods the estrogen receptors so much they stop working. So it's like you're not giving any estrogen at all. So those women will come back with all their menopausal symptoms again. That's okay. fascinating. So, yeah. so, but you can't tell by looking at them whether yeah. it's over a thousand and they've mm. gone into tachyphylaxis or whether mm. it's that actually they're not absorbing it and you haven't given enough. So in some clinics, they just keep giving more and more and more and more, which of course is going to make, make things worse. And I've seen patients where they've come from the, those clinics and they're on massive doses of estrogen and their histamine is through the roof. Their histamine is on the ceiling and they are so unwell with all the symptoms. So we have to unpick it, you know, mm. and know 
where are we with the blood levels? What's what's happening? Does really this patient have a history of histamine? Yeah, I really respect that because I do wonder sometimes there seems to be that attitude in many areas of health in terms of, oh, you don't need to test, it's fine. But I think common sense would support the idea that, of course, you need to test. But I do wonder if cost is a factor because um, I know that... Um, I'm trying to think, it's a while since I've been in clinical practice, but it used to, say, for example, a vitamin D test used to be a much more standard part of your uh, mm. blood tests and it was something that you could easily access, whereas now it's so much more difficult to access. It's something that's gone into an at-home test. Mm. Um, and it's always quite interesting to me that I feel like certain tests are becoming harder and harder to access. And I wonder yeah. if that's a resource or a cost issue or what's going on. I yeah. don't know really what the answer is, but I know that some of the tests to the NHS are so cheap. Yeah, I know. Like a fiver, you know, yeah, per yeah. test. And it could change someone's, mm. you know, well, whole it can, trajectory. It can enable us to give proper clinical management. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway. I, I, so, was, I was literally just chucking I was going for a questions in your couple of things you've answered like a, just a ton of these questions that we wanted to ask oh that's good <laughs> I, like, I wanted to go back actually to your point with um, histamine and oestrogen though before mm. we go off um, to some of the other questions because you mentioned that you will take a patient's history and you'll look at um, certain symptoms or things that might suggest there could be underlying MCAS. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what those things that you see are, just for anyone yes, listening yes, so that they kind of... Yes. Yeah. So histamine, um, when histamine is elevated, it can affect all our systems. And uh, normally it's very uh, super regulated by the body because it knows that when the mast cells release these chemicals, they can have very far reaching biochemical Im Im impact, can have a very far reaching biochemical impact on the body and on different systems. So when somebody is releasing more histamine than they need, you can get inflammation and the inflammation will express itself differently in different people and in the same person at different times, you know, differently in different times. Um, so that can be a bit confusing. But it, in the skin, usually it's rashes, hives, eczema, psoriasis, rosacea. So any history of any of those sort of things. Bruising as well, because it can affect... It can affect your uh, clotting factors Very and cause, a well, it also releases heparin. The mast cells, one of the, the cytokines is heparin and that produces bruising. So if, you're, if your mast cells are super active, people get a lot of bruises and they don't even know what they've knocked themselves with. You know, it's just like, I remember when Jessie was super sick and her histamine was literally on the top of a skyscraper. I mean, it was really high. When she just touched her, ch her chest, she left fingerprints of bruises. Just from touching her skin, she was bruising that easy. She had so much heparin. Anyway, so <clears throat> so the skin. Then have they got a history of uh, asthmatic type symptoms, uh, inflammation in the lungs? Have they got sinusitis, bronchi history of bronchitis? Have they got, um, often there might be a history of living with mold. So they've got mycotoxins, which have constantly triggered their mast cells. Um, then you've got uh, chronic headaches, migraine. Uh, histamine causes vasodilatation, and that can cause migraine. Um, have they got, what else, muscle aches and pains? Um, so maybe they've been given the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, but my, fibromyalgia is actually a symptom rather than a diagnosis. So have they got tender muscles? Uh, what else? IBS, <laughs> classically, inflammation in the gut, nausea, vomiting, distension, uh, dysbiosis, uh, constipation, diarrhea, sometimes fluctuating between the two mm -hmm. with, with great drama. You know, poor patients. I've had patients who have had diarrhea eight, nine times a day, every day for decades. Now, can you imagine urgent diarrhea eight or nine times a day? How do you, how do, you do anything? You know, how do you go somewhere? You have to know where all the toilets are on your route to work. I mean, nightmare, complete yeah. nightmare. And you give them a type 2 antihistamine, famotidine, and it stops within 24 hours. Amazing. So, I mean, this is just, some of it's miraculous. What yeah. can well, because that's a true, like, disability to have, oh. like, diarrhea eight to ten times a and day, like that is. Yeah, and you're not absorbing all your nutrients, yeah. you know, imagine yeah. how depleted they are. Yeah. 
you know, and then that will create and other you're more symptoms. More tired and yes. more anxious. Yep. And exactly, you know. yep. exactly. So um, yeah, so all of these kind of histories. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, yes, it, usually the patients are very. Um, they have very good, you know, descriptions of of how things have affected them because they've been living with it for decades and they know exactly what triggers them. Often, also, the women say, "I used to be able to drink alcohol, and now I can't drink any alcohol." They go flushing of the face and they feel toxic and so on. And that seems to get worse uh, because alcohol is very high in histamine, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a great histamine releaser. And it also blocks diamine oxidase, which is one of the enzymes that breaks down histamine. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, all these clues, um, it's pretty obvious when you know what you're looking for, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I, that's fascinating. And I think sometimes if for anyone that's kind of new to this, I think it can be really helpful just hearing those symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, because as you were saying with a lot of your patients, they kind of show up and they're like, oh, I'm quite healthy. And, you know, that's just who I am. I've always had these things. That's part of me, as opposed to from your perspective, you're like, hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, this is ex- actually significant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's telling us something, isn't exactly. it? It's telling us something. I wanted to ask a little mm-hmm. bit on, so those are the symptoms around histamine and then kind of coming back with the menopause connection I'm quite curious in terms of the hormonal history for these women that really really struggle with um, symptoms of menopause um, either related to MCAS or in general do you see any um, commonalities in their hormonal history say with PMS, PCOS, kind of anything like that. Well, we believe that endometriosis and PCOS is associated with mast cell activation. Multiple miscarriages, also something we see in women who've got MCAS. That's interesting. Um, Yes, it's all to do with inflammation. Mm. And um, um, what else? Uh, So endometriosis, PCOS, uh, miscarriages... um, Often they give a history of progestogen sensitivity. So mm-hmm. they can't take the combined pill, didn't get on with that, couldn't take the mini pill, felt terrible on that, this kind of history. And that alerts me to, well, maybe this patient's got MCAS because MCAS women are progesterone sensitive in the main, which is a shame because progesterone can help MCAS. Mm-hmm. So when I've got somebody who isn't progesterone sensitive, it can be helpful to give them some natural micronized progesterone and that will reduce their histamine and increase their diamine oxidase production. Um, And also, um, this is a a good time to tell you that when, when when we've tried to sort out and lower their mast cells in this group of women and then we start giving them HRT, sometimes we come a cropper when we try and give them progesterone. So if they haven't had a hysterectomy and they've got... Um, their uterus, and they need to have progesterone as well as estrogen, you start giving them the progesterone and they don't tolerate it because they're progesterone intolerant. And that is really tricky because they want the estrogen and they want the benefits of HRT, but we have to find a way of getting them, giving them some progesterone. Um, And so we either give it vaginally Sometimes that metabolizes differently and sometimes they can tolerate it like that. Sometimes we give it for a smaller dose for less time, less frequently. We try and do all these tricks and monitor their lining of their uterus because it's outside license use then, obviously. Make sure that what we're giving them is actually maintaining a thin endometrium uh, against the estrogen influence, which is trying to thicken the endometrium. Uh, so it's it can be a bit more complicated for these women. Um, the Mirena will work in some of them, which is Levin or Gestrel, and, um, and some of them will tolerate that because it is a much smaller dose of progestogen, even though it's not a natural um, progestogen. Um, and, but some of them won't even tolerate the Mirena. And then we've got the Kylina and the JDS, which are smaller Mirenas, and they have lower doses. Uh, but that's out of license use. It's only the Mirena that's got the license for HRT endometrial protection. But out of license, with full, fully informed consent from the patient, we have been using Kylenas and some JDSs in some patients 
who want the HRT and need some endometrial protection. And they have a scan every five, six months to make sure the lining is thin. And so far, we started doing that at Chelsea Westminster and the big menopause clinic there. And so far, um, as to my knowledge, everyone who's been scanned, it has been sufficient to maintain a thin endometrium. So we're getting away with it. But, you know, we're having to think outside the box a bit for these ladies. Mm. That's so interesting because I just think, I mean, I can only speak for as a woman, um, but I really do believe that your relationship with your hormones throughout your life can really dictate that life because they're so powerful when they're not in balance. Absolutely. Um, and often we see women um, who have PMT type symptoms that often goes with MCAS mm -hmm. and painful and heavy periods as well. Yeah. yeah. And a type type 2 antihistamine is often the best treatment for heavy painful periods. Which isn't thought of. <laughs> yeah. which, which but mm. most yeah. people still think of histamine and like hay fever and that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. But actually yeah. it's it can affect every single system. You've got we've got four types of receptors, histamine receptors, and they're in different as you know, different tissues, yeah. you know. So it's going to affect different parts of the body, including the brain. Yeah. yeah. It's you know? why we keep saying to people that when you speak to your GP or go to your healthcare professional, you need to speak to them about the histamine receptors and understand which receptors being triggered to work out which antihistamine you to need. Take, you yeah. can't just prescribe them. When I had my experience with urticaria, like the, the doctor had just prescribed me what he thought would, would work yeah. best for me. And he didn't really talk about the receptors in much interest. And I think you've hit the nail on the head mm. there. Understanding which antihistamine you need for this receptor mm. and even the form of the antihistamine that you're using as well because that chemical formulation is very, very important how your body actually responds to it. Absolutely. And some of some of the patients are so sensitive to excipients. They can't just have any old off-the-shelf um, antihistamine. It has to be special, you know, specially put together in a specialist pharmacy and formulated with no excipients, no dyes, uh, etc. So, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, we've had to learn a lot. <laughs> well, it, you know, just for everyone listening in, so yeah, as you were saying about the antihistamine, what it does is it blocks that receptor and it inhibits the histamine attaching to that receptor. Because it inhibits attaching to the receptor, the person doesn't feel the symptoms that they're feeling or getting, which it, I'm caught, from my understanding of allopathic medicine, the whole point of doing that is to lower that immune response because if you if receptors aren't being triggered, then the immune response reduces. Am I, yeah. am I right? Yes, that's right. And and if you but you've got high histamine levels hitting all these receptors, and you're going to block the receptors, but you still want to get the histamine levels down. So you're covering some of the symptoms and giving mm. some relief, quite rightly. Um, by blocking those receptors. But in the meantime, in the background, you want to lower the cytokine release, the release of those cytokines, heparin, elastase 2, you know, all the rest of it, and histamine predominantly, and, and bring them down. Um, and that's why you need, uh, it's not just about giving the antihistamines. It's about the holistic approach. It's about uh, looking at the diet and having a low histamine diet. It's about... Um, uh, I really recommend a paleo ketogenic diet, which I'm sure Sarah Myhill talked about. Uh, she's very keen on that as well. And, um, you know, paleo ketogenic or certainly ketogenic if you can't manage the paleo, but no gluten because gluten is high in histamine. Um, and sugar isn't great for us. You know, sugar feeds cancer. Uh, it's very addictive. Um, it's just really we should all be trying to do without sugar. Uh, get, you know, keeping away from the processed foods, nothing left over, everything freshly prepared, organic if you can. As a low histamine diet, a low carb diet, really good for you, good for your brain to be living off ketones, um, good for your waistline, uh, <laughs> you know, fantastic. Um, intermittent fasting, really helpful, it calms the mast cells down, increases autophagy, but you need to have a fast of 16 hours to switch autophagy on. And then you really want to be allowing yourself to have two hours further of star of fasting, not starving, fasting, um, for that autophagy to be working for two hours. So you're clearing out the any diseased, infected, precancerous cells of your body. Just getting to 16 hours isn't good enough because you're 
then you eat, you've switched it off immediately. Um, and um, yeah, so, you, you know, optimizing your body weight, maximizing your exercise and movement, so important. Um, grounding, really important. Go outside every day barefooted, you know, touch the ground. Even in the winter, I go out, as soon as I wake up, go downstairs. My husband hears me opening the back door. He thinks, oh, she's off again. <laughs> go outside barefooted on the grass in the spring and summer. It's easy. You dead had the roses and you, you know, you're out there. Look at the sun, close your eyes. So you're getting the sun hitting the back of your retina through your lid. So you're not looking directly at the sun, but you look at it, but close your eyes. Get that on the back, sets your circadian rhythm. Get your three million electrons from Mother Earth by standing barefooted. Um, but in the winter, it's not so easy. I go out and use my hands, not my feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I touch my grass <laughs> and just say a few prayers <laughs> and get, get it that way. But it's so important and encourage people to go out at lunchtime again and then in the evening as the sun's coming down. Set your circadian rhythm. Improve your sleep quality. Improve your sleep. Yeah, very important. So I can't remember what I was, why we, I was saying that. Um, yeah, talking so talking about the histamine connection the histi a bit more. Uh, just like lowering the histamine. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. yes, lowering the histamine. So we we want to do, we want a holistic approach. We want to do that. Um, we want to stabilize the mast cells. Is usually very helpful. So mast cell stabilizers like ketotifen, rupatidine, um, sodium chromoglycate for the gut mast cells stabilize them, make them behave better. And then um, reduce um, some of the uh, chemicals that can be released by something like low-dose naltrexone. That can be very, very helpful in anything that ends in itis. So <laughs> anything with in inflammation um, and uh, that, you know, the toll-like receptors, it blocks those. It's fantastic. So really, really useful. I've seen some miracles with LDN, mm -hmm. uh, literally. Absolutely fantastic. I've got one lady. She had had psoriatic arthritis from the age of six and um, and she were, came to see me very unwell. Um, she was going to be given methotrexate uh, for her, her um, psoriatic arthritis, obviously an immune suppressant. And prior to that, they had said to her, we're going to give you lots of vaccines to um, give your immune system a boost so that you can then have this immun immunosuppressant. And they gave her 12 vaccinations in a year. At what age? Um, she's 38. They gave her five COVID vaccines, three HPV, uh, a, a whole load of others. Anyway, she had 12 in one year. And this lady um, had mast cell activation syndrome, which I believe is why she had the psoriatic arthritis. And she had other symptoms which backed that up, you know. Um, and when I saw her, she could literally, she was only eating two foods. She was eating bananas and, and chicken. And if she ate anything else, she had an anaphylactic type reaction. So she was outside casualty trying new foods so that if she had a reaction, she could run into casualty. It was that scary. And she was so unwell. She had to leave her family home and her children to live with her parents. So they could look after her. And we had to, she was sensitive to all supplements, everything. And we had to very gently, gently calm her system. And at the second consultation, I said, right, I think now we can give you um, low dose naltrexone. I think it's worth trying. Let's talk about that. There's a very good website called ldnresearchtrust.org for everyone to look at. Lots of explanation and description on that site. Um, and she looked at that and she said, yes, I would like to take it. So fine. So gave her a tiny, tiny dose. Sublingual liquid is the best form. T start off with a really small dose, especially in her, being so sensitive. She emailed me uh, after she'd been on it for four days. And she said, Tina, you, c you will not believe it. She said, I woke up this morning and 95% of my psoriasis, which I've had since the age of six, has gone. Day four. Wow. Amazing. Life-changing. Yeah, that, that, Life-changing. It is literally life-changing. Yeah. She could, could, and now she's so much better. She's eating more food. You know, she's back at home with her kids, everything. So it's just like, it was a miracle. Amazing. Amazing. So, yeah, so we do that. Um, and um, things like, um, I use an ARC device. 
Uh, people might have heard me talk about that, which is I'm going to put some information on my website about the Arc device, actually. Um, this is a microcurrent device because we are 2 million volts walking around attached to a few cells, basically. And all our cells talk to each other by microcurrents. Mm -hmm. And um, it's affected by everything, you know, all the electricity around us, Wi-Fi, mobile phones, 5G towers, that does impact our biomagnetic resonance. And um, this little device gives you a microcurrent. You can't feel it. You wear it for at least three hours a day. And it boosts your ATP production three to five fold. So that enables your body to heal itself much more efficiently because everything takes energy. And our mitochondria are super, super important. I'm sure Sarah talked about them. So inside each cell, we have these little beans, which are mitochondria. They make ATP, which is the energy of life. It's like the fuel that keeps our engine going. We need to make 70 to 80 kilograms of ATP every day, which is mind boggling. We need so much fuel every day, but it, it's burnt up as fast as it's made, mm. um, which is extraordinary. And if we took all our mitochondria and put them in a pile, it would be 32% of our body weight. Wow. Is that extraordinary? Incredible. A third of our body weight mm. is mitochondria, and that's you know how important they are. So mitochondrial health is key to everything. If you have healthy mitochondria producing good levels of ATP, then all your systems will function very well. Um, if you have dysfunctional mitochondria and they become dysfunctional because of radiation, uh, because of toxins, because of drugs, uh, prescribed drugs like statins and omeprazole destroy mitochondria, um, then those might, the, the ATP production is going to be inhibited and your body's going to have to prioritize the essential activities and things like reducing inflammation and healing are going to go low on their list of priorities, right? So if you could do anything to boost your mitochondrial health and to, um, to, to be, uh, have more energy, then you're going to have the energy for the body to heal itself, which is fascinating. And the body can heal itself very, very well, given the right environment. Mm. I just, I just literally just so much good information just coming from that. I'm just sat there just like mm. flabbergasted by it all. Right. I want to, I want to pivot a little bit. Yes. Supplements. Yes. Do you use supplements and yes. recommend them? And if so, why? Okay. So. Because obviously this is, you know, I'm going to cheekily just ask this because I want to, I want to know a bit more about this because I think yeah. a lot of people, because I know you're professional and you do you recommend medications? But I also know from speaking to you and some of your patients that you do talk about using other supplements, looking at them. Yeah. So what do you recommend and when do you recommend them and like how? Okay, so... Let's get into this. Yeah, okay. So um, every second in every cell, we have 100,000 different biochemical processes happening per second, which is why we need so much ATP. Okay. And... Those biochemical processes use loads and loads of enzymes. And enzymes need cofactors. And those cofactors are vitamins and minerals and trace elements. So we are using them up at a rate of knots. Okay. Our diet nowadays, no matter how good you try to make it, you know, I mean, I consider myself to have a really good diet. I have organic, freshly prepared. I have histamine issues, so I, no process, no leftovers, all the rest of it. And yet the quality of our soil and the microbiome of our soil is now so poor because of centuries of farming, because of insecticides and pesticides and toxins in the atmosphere, etc., that we're not getting the full goodness from our food like we should or like our ancestors used to. Therefore, we need to supplement. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And, um, and then you want to take good quality supplements and you want to get supplements that are in a, a, a way that can be absorbed by the body. Uh, one of the things I'm very keen on is a liquid called Life Minerals. And it's got 70 different minerals and trace elements in it. Mm -hmm. Because it's a liquid, it's really well absorbed. And you just take 15 mils every morning and you're sorted with all your uh, all your minerals. I mean, fantastic. Um, and uh, and often when, we, when people have had tests done to see what their levels are like, they are deficient in various um, uh, 
at various ones. So to take something like that is very sensible and uh, will increase health. And then, um, uh, so there's that. And then vitamin D, terribly, terribly important. Vitamin D is a it's a pro-hormone. It's um, it has effects on our immune system, on our circulation, on our on our steroid hormones. Um, it it just affects our mood. Uh, vitamin D is just so important, isn't it? it affects testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. It affects everything, and uh, our bones. It's just so important to good health. And most of us in this country are vitamin D deficient because we don't get enough sun. What a surprise. I mean, look at June and July. Mm. Well, July and August now, it's so grey all the time. We're not getting the sun coming through. Um, and most of us have very sedentary indoor kind of lives. We're in cars or we're in offices all day. And especially people who have coloured skin, they need even more sunshine because it has to penetrate their lovely pigment to, you know, to get through. So vitamin D supplementation is very important. And we found that in COVID, for example, um, people who were um, more susceptible to COVID generally had low vitamin, were vitamin D deficient because it does affect our immune systems. Mm. So very, very important to take vitamin D. Um, the uh, the active vitamin D is the uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D is more bioavailable, so it's useful to have that. And the doses that people have been told have been too low, historically. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like preaching to the choir. It's like literally. That's just not pre- something you talk about, is it? Because <laughs> <laughs> we know that 10,000 units is perfectly safe, yeah. and we also know that if you went if you're on holiday in the med somewhere and you exposed your sun your skin sorry to the sun between uh, 11 o'clock and one o'clock in 10 minutes you'd make 10,000 units of vitamin d you make a thousand units a minute right so it's very safe it's that's what nature has made us make that kind of level and if you take 10,000 international units a day which is what i do um then you will have a level probably of about 200 uh, picomoles per litre, or non, nanomoles per litre, sorry. Is it nano or Yeah, nanomoles, yeah. Nanomoles, yeah. nanomoles per litre. Um, and it's only if it goes over 375 that you can have hypercalcemia. So no, no, nothing to worry about there. So 10,000 units, perfectly safe to take and actually rather important. So, yeah, vitamin D. Um, vitamin C, great vitamin C, because vitamin C is an antibiotic, it is antibacterial. It is uh, anti-inflammatory. It's antihistamine. So it's fantastic. And all of these wonderful supplements that can do things that have the same effects as medication. You know, let's use them instead. Really lovely. So I have five grams of vitamin C slow release every morning. Um, and uh, then we've got things like vitamin A and vitamin E um, are really good for your brain. Um, there's a very good website I'd like everyone to look at called foodforthebrain.org and alzheimerprevention.info. And these have been put together by the wonderful Patrick Holford, who's written about 42 books on brain health and dementia and preventing dementia. And he says that less than 1% of dementia is genetic, is inherited. And you would know if you have the gene in your family because people would get dementia in their 50s. And if you haven't got any family members who have been struggling with that, then you know you haven't got it, in which case it's preventable and there's no excuse <laughs> for getting dementia. Um, and so it's about uh, vit- the, you know, having the right vitamins and minerals to feed your brain mm. and keep it healthy, which includes... Sorry. No, on. sorry. I, this is totally um, a more personal question because um, my, my aunt has... Uh, has dementia my grandmother had dementia are you saying there that the only genetically linked dementia is early onset yes and unless you're seeing early onset dementia in your family not just dementia that it's preventable absolutely yeah i just i absolutely. thought that's what you were saying i just wanted yeah. to clarify that because i no, think people will be interested absolutely absolutely so less than one percent of dementia is inherited everything else is preventable so that means over 99% of dementia cases were preventable. They were caused by poor diet or drugs. 
or life, lifestyle, basically. Right. So yeah. we have to think about that, and therefore we know we can prevent it. I mean, that's great news, isn't it? I that's thought that exciting. was amazing. I think it's so exciting. That's so exciting, because <laughs> the idea of having dementia is just like, and sugar can cause dementia. So let's come off the sugar, everybody. You know, sugar, sugar, sugar. Sugar causes dementia. And uh, vitamin, um, so you want your omega-3, very important, protective, vitamin A, vitamin D, uh, sorry, yes, vitamin C, um, then um, luteolin, and uh, what else? There's, oh, look after your mitochondria. Your brain is full of mitochondria. So you want to have mitochondrial protective um, vitamins and minerals. Uh, so that is um, vitamin C, magnesium, um, vitamin D with K2, uh, vitamin B3, um, that's thi um, thiamine, how's, uh, vitamin B3, the, no, the niacinamide, but no, no flush one because that's... Flushing is horrible. Mm -hmm. um, 1,500 milligrams a day of that. And L-carnitine, um, very important. Iodine, very important. Iodine, iodine, iodine. I tell all my women to go on iodine. Iodine, we are 96% of the adults in this country are iodine deficient. When I was a little girl, they used to put iodine in the bread. And so nobody was iodine deficient. And then they took it out of the bread. <sighs> That was a missed opportunity. They still iodinize salt um, in a lot of the continental countries, but they don't but not over here. here anymore. No. Yeah, I, I don't know, know why. That why is. not? Yeah, good question. That's interesting. Yeah, good question, Tracy. <laughs> we should, shouldn't we? So I recommend Lugol's iodine, fifteen percent, uh, and to use it, um, I take three three drops in some water, small amount of water at night before I go to bed. Um, just down it straight. And it's very good for keeping your upper gut cleansed um, because we should have a sterile upper gut. The first mm -hmm. 20 feet of our gut should be sterile. I'm sure Sarah talked about that. <laughs> and, the, and the microbiome should be in the last five feet in the large intestine. Um, Why do you take it at night? I take it at night because I want to take it away from my vitamin C and I take my vitamin C in, the, in the morning because they I negate see. each other. So, um, And the other thing um, is another top tip if you mix some drops of vitamin of, of Lugol's iodine with some coconut oil, it's uh, fantastic for athlete's foot. <laughs> Apply that twice a day and you'll get rid of athlete's foot. That's a really Because it's tip. very antiseptic. Yeah. Yeah. And very on point with the Olympics going on. <laughs> <laughs> very good. And, yeah. it, and you're absorbing it as well, which is good for you. So it's, fi it's fine. Yeah. But the iodine is very good for all of your glands. So that's mm -hmm. prostate gland, breast, you know, and we and keeps them healthy. Mm -hmm. So we're all for keeping all of our glands healthy. And it's quite inexpensive as well. Very as inexpensive. Supplements go, which I very think cheap. Is, yeah. yeah. Very, very cheap. Yes. Indeed. I've got to ask. These, what you're saying is very, coming from a very educated place. Someone, you know, you can tell as you're talking through this, you've gone through, you're answering things from a base, you're explaining it, you're explaining the, the, the function, you're explaining with research, you're explaining this is how it's working. You're answering and asking the why. You must get a lot of stick for that. But I'm asking it because... This is when I talked to Sarah about this and we went into detail about it. She, the first thing she said to me was like, we are not allowed to ask the why. And if we are asked the why, we're, we're basically disbanded. And, but you're not only asking it, you're answering it. Mm. That must not, mm. not go down right for a lot of people. I don't know. <laughs> I just innocently carry on doing it <laughs> because it's the right thing to do. I mean, you know, when I, was, when I went to medical school, I was very lucky. I had some wonderful, I was at Guy's Medical School in London and there were some marvellous professors and lecturers and teachers and they got us to think critically. And whilst the curriculum wasn't all that it could be, because I kept saying every, every term I would say, when are we going to get the lecture on nutrition? You know, and the, it never came, right? <laughs> and so that was a big disappointment. And then you get so busy working with all, because the, they load you with so much work you know, the, all the pharmacology, the biochemistry, the physiology, the da, 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 that you've got so much to learn, you just have to bury yourself in it. You don't have time you, to think. <laughs> yeah, there's no time to think, absolutely. But when I, but I used to think a bit, and I used to think, where, where is the, where is the stuff on nutrition and lifestyle and exercise and all? Of and we never got it. But I did. I was lucky enough to have some lecturers who encouraged us to think critically, and to analyze things, and not just to accept everything that you were presented. 
and to think about the why and why is this happening and what what's causing this and and um, and they also taught us to um, be the kind of doctors that would use their clinical acumen and their experience and their knowledge to help the patient sitting in front of them. And every patient is different. You know, the human body is very complex. And we aren't just we aren't just physical beings, we're spiritual beings as well. It's all very complicated, isn't it? You know, and you've got to try and address all of that and know teach treat everybody as an individual. That requires thinking. <laughs> that requires it's not a tick box exercise. People don't fit into a protocol very often. And when I started in medicine, there were no protocols. And there were no guidelines. We learned the stuff and then we had to learn how to apply it using our clinical knowledge, acumen and experience. And it was only in the, I don't know, when was it? In the mid 80s. Yeah, I qualified in 83, a long time ago. I'll be 41 years qualified this this month. Actually, I am 41 years qualified Wow! on the 1st of August. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. So, so, um, yeah, so I, I think it was probably in the late 80s, early 90s, they started bringing in guidelines, which were there to guide you. And they were quite helpful. You know, yes, it sort of helped pull pull you at some of your knowledge and ex, uh, into a sort of a, a more um, sort of palatable, I suppose, or a more digestible kind of list, uh, tick list. So that was helpful. And then they brought in protocols. And protocols are slightly different, aren't they? Guidelines are to guide you and help you make your decisions, but you're free to make your your recommendations and discuss it with the patient. Protocols are, if you don't fit the protocol, sorry, we can't help you, which are the nice guidelines, protocols coming up. And, and doctors have been pushed and pushed more and more into this funnel of... Is it, if it doesn't fit the protocol that comes up on their computer, then they can't help patients. I'm getting loads of patients telling me that their GPs are saying to them, I'm sorry, I can't help you because you don't fit the protocol. It's like, well, I'm still here and I've got these symptoms. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> that yeah. doesn't help me, does it? And they are told, sorry, there's nothing we can do for you, which to me isn't, that's not helpful. That's not critical thinking. No. And that, they're not thinking outside the box. They're not thinking, they're not using their experience and knowledge. And I'm not suggesting that all GPs are doing that. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm certainly hearing about some doing that. I, I do feel as well that, because um, I've definitely experienced that. I've spoken to so many people that have experienced that. And I definitely there's great practitioners in all walks of life out and there's not so great ones. But sometimes I I wonder you know, even speaking to some GPs and other doctors that it's hitting them hard as well, but that they're yeah. so scared to walk outside of the lines because yeah. I think sometimes there can be a lot of fear mongering um, in terms of, and there's mm -hmm. so much, I think we're very heavily legislated. And yes. um, I think even sometimes the professionals that do want to step outside and really help it can be quite a scary move yeah. to make. So it's yes. easier to kind of say, sorry, I yes. can't help you find yeah. someone Their else. hands are tied. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I suppose so. And I, I maybe because I'm working in private practice, I haven't got that influence around me mm. so much. So I just sort of work safely and evidence-based. It's always evidence-based what I do. And it's always safe and it's always with full discussion and with the patient, full disclosure about everything. And, we come to some kind of treatment plan, you know, some kind of roadmap for them to try. And you um, get results. And we get results. And some things work and some things don't. And some things work in one person, but they don't in another. Um, and that's, you know, we, we're on this road of discovery together, really, trying to help help improve their health and their quality of life. And the feedback I get from patients is amazing, you know, absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, uh, I suppose I, I just practicing good what I consider to be good medicine <laughs> but maybe I'm not <laughs> no I, I, I yeah. really really mm. admire that because I think it takes a lot of uh, courage to you know kind of go That's after you're one of my heroes. maybe I'm just naive <laughs> maybe I'm just naive actually and it's if and therefore I just get, carry on doing it 
blindly. Well, if, that's, <laughs> if that's what's working and helping yeah. people, then keep going. I we need more naive. <laughs> I can't. I can't see any reason to change it because yeah. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not. I'm practicing evidence-based medicine. Yeah. And it's all. It's all founded in science. Mm. So with full discussion, and so, you know, mm. I can't see that there's a problem with that. Um, and and you have to tell the truth, don't you? Yeah, I mean, because when I when I interviewed um, Sarah and I sat down with her, like, firstly, what an incredible, incredible human being, and she, you know, the conversation I have never give, been given so much flack for what she said. People were just not like they were like pulling up reports and saying, "Oh, did you see this? Is that?" And every single person that was sending this. I said, if you, if she's helped thousands of patients, but one had a problem, that's a very low percentage. But if she's helped so many people, where's mm. the issue here? When mm. you look at medication, certain medications, mm. like we, we, we talked briefly about PPIs. Yes. And when she told me about, because she knows the person who published the actual book on proton pump inhibitors like she's not talking from a place of nonsense she's no, literally telling she's you she's well read she's well, read. well connected yes. and as you said yeah. evidence-based mm. she literally came out and told me that and mm. i i kind of like sat there and there's this i don't know what it is but for some reason you talked about spirituality and so like i want to move on to that because i don't think we talk about this but mm. it's something that i think is very important to me mm. and to tracy we're very spiritual people in our own, own respect try to be try to be but it's mm. like there's this new drive in society where we have to put people down mm. where we've got this idea that like if it doesn't fit into our narrative mm. we need to make them fit our narrative if not you are you're the you're the black sheep yeah or criticism yes that's a shame isn't it because there's there's so much to learn mm. and there's so much we still don't know and um there's so many people to help and there are so many ways. There's more than one way to skin a cat, isn't there? There's, sorry to use that. That's not a very nice thing to say, is it really? But um, <laughs> there's more than one way of doing things, isn't there? And um, so it, we should be exploring this together with open minds and open hearts and, you know, use our critical thinking and look for evidence. I can't see that there's anything wrong with doing that. And if that means questioning the narrative which has been perpetuated and accepted without seeing the evidence, then I think that's a good thing. And if it's if the evidence is there, it will stand up to to yeah. to scrutiny, won't it? Mm -hmm. And if um if it if it really is something good, then let's see the evidence and let's discuss it. And and I'm very happy to admit that I'm wrong. You know, I, and I would never say I know everything. I don't. I feel like I only know the tiny surface of, of what there is to know. You know, there's so much to learn. And I'm, I'm always in awe of some of my colleagues who just are incredible. They've got amazing minds and they can read something and remember it immediately. My, my brain is slowing down. I have to look at things several times and then I might even forget. But, you know, I, I just think we're all in this together. We need to support each other, listen to each other. And just keep an open mind about everything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's 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 questioned our like when I talk about spirituality in that way, it's it's made people like you know you're either in this party or this party. I'm not going to get into politics now or anything, but it's you have to be fitting into those boxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at the human mind, we talk about critical thinking, asking the why. We should be able to ask the why, but when you're coming from a position of negativity, if you're coming out the bat and saying you're wrong, but you're not understanding it, mm -hmm. what you're allowed to have, you're allowed to, I always say to people, you are allowed your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts yeah. because you just aren't. Facts mm -hmm. are facts and opinion is yes. opinion. Yeah. But if you've got an opinion on something, that's fine. Yeah. You're allowed to fit, have yep. that opinion, yep. but let's openly discuss it. And mm -hmm. when I spoke to Sarah, she it was it felt a bit like she had been challenged because she had an opinion mm -hmm. and like and i'm quite shocked you haven't been challenged on your opinions yet which i'm no. quite uh, what i'm one impressed by and fingers crossed keeps going on would you mind just talking about your experience with histamine binders obviously you know yeah so yeah so only yesterday um i sent your um your lovely protocols to one of my patients so um i find tox prevent very very helpful 
uh, in lowering histamine binding with it, especially the sachets at night, stopping that 3 p.m., 4 p.m. dump of histamine, um, which often wakes people and causes them to have disturbed sleep. So um, certainly a lot of patients do use uh, zeolites and specifically toxoprevent um, for mycotoxins and for inflammation and for histamine levels, uh, for rosacea, uh, etc. So really very, very helpful, very useful. And to detox because with mast cell activation, one of the principles of treatment is to get rid of all the triggers. Uh, whatever those triggers may be. So whether that's high histamine food or it's stress or it's um, um, you know toxins, um, heavy metals, etc. It's cleaning the body out, getting rid of all of these toxins. And uh, think using things like the zeolite um, tox prevent is fantastic and can be really helpful. And it's not a medication. It's not prescribed. You know, it doesn't have to be prescribed. They can buy it for themselves. They can try it and take it for two months, three months, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I find it very, very helpful. I mean, the, the, the great thing about with it, like is, as you mentioned it, it's... Um the medical device aspect of it like how it's working in the system and that's actually how we actually first met as well because mm. i remember to be honest with you tina you won't know this but when when i actually met you you introduced me to professor vic Kular as well but i think yeah. not many realize but you actually gave me my first opportunity to actually present what we were offering and a lot of what we've done, I actually do attribute to the success that you've actually given us. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> I just want you to know that I'm saying on camera, uh, so you'll know, and so people. But you've been a you've been a massive advocate for us as well in other ways mm. that you've probably never even realised. No, I and, didn't. And that's why I've been a massive advocate for you as well because I've realised everything that you've said and done has been. You've not challenged the status quo. You've not just questioned it you've looked at it in a way that most people aren't looking at it and everything you know today that we've talked about with menopause and with hrt when we did our first initial conversation you know nearly a year ago now i it, it changed the way i looked at a lot of like even protocols with a lot of people that we talked to and it made me realize and clock that you're answering that why and that's what a lot of people that are regarded as menopause specialists are just not doing. Mm. And that for me is scary. Mm. And so for you to like be able to look at it from this position here and say, right, this is how I'm looking at allopathically and this is how I'm looking at holistically is a game changer. Mm. And I think that is like functional medicine at its best. Mm. Mm. It's essential though. <laughs> so to my mind, it's essential if you're going to uh, address things properly and help the people properly and you know for for um, the majority of women they haven't got mast cell activation and the sort of you know bog standard approach will work but there's an awful lot of women for whom that just does you know one size does not fit all and they have got this other uh, special circumstances that need to be taken into consideration and unless you address it you're not going to sort them out properly and, and HRT is so life-giving it really is so um helpful for women to be able to go on hrt uh, and we we know that if a woman doesn't go on hrt then on average she will live for 20.4 years with a chronic disease well that's a quarter of her life mm. with a chronic disease which could be osteoporosis heart disease dementia parkinson's you know muscle wasting um all of these things do not give you a good quality of life. And we work hard all our lives, bringing up our families, working, bringing a home together. Um, and then when we retire, we want to enjoy a bit of me time. And, you know, lo and behold, they'll be looking at 20 years of chronic, <laughs> chronic disease. And maybe not even just one of them. They might have several, you know, so which will impinge on their quality of life, their ability to travel and keep fit and uh, et cetera, and, and help their families and look after the grandchildren or whatever they want to do. So uh, it's so important for women to understand about HRT, I feel. It's not just about sorting out their symptoms now, but I'm interested in their giving them good health for the future, you know, investing in their future so that they can be in their 70s and 80s and go, yes, you know. 
And like you said, mm. that, you know, you talked to me, you mentioned a bit more about the histamine four receptor as well. And what's really interesting is now, like just, you talked about rheumatoid arthritis, you briefly mentioned it. And I, I've, I'm, I'm going to chuckle because I did a conversation, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago. And I said, to, I said to someone, I goes, did you know that rheumatoid arthritis is linked with the histamine four receptor and is linked with mast activation syndrome? And it, just in my opinion, this is my opinion. This isn't like based of anything that I'm like, not just saying it's from like a pace of a, I'm saying from a place of evidence, basically, that I really do believe rheumatoid arthritis is like the final stage of mast cells being really activated. That's where mm -hmm. you're literally, your histamine one, your histamine two, your histamine three are so exhausted that our, our rheumatoid arthritis is the next. And now mm -hmm. in 2024, they're in, they've patented a histamine 4 receptor antagonist. So there's an antihistamine coming out for it very soon. And they're looking at it, bearing in mind in 2006, they were saying that there's no such thing as a, as mast cells in, in the histamine 4 receptor, which just boggled me. They said there's no such thing as rheumatoid arthritis and mast cells have nothing to do with it. But now science has moved on and finally mm. we've got that stage where we've got new treatments for it. It's very interesting how gradually the papers are coming out that are, are substantiating a lot of what we're saying. So, for example, in um, in COVID, uh, the spike protein enters the mast cells, not just through the ACE2 receptor, but also through the histamine receptors. So it's all very, very linked with COVID and creating a lot of cytokine release from the mast cells, actually entering through the histamine receptors. Because you talk a lot about NAC, if I'm, if I'm correct. Yes, yes, yes. So NAC, N-acetylcysteine, is is a fantastic supplement. It's a very strong antioxidant in the body. It's um, it's converted in the body to glutathione, which is the strongest one. Uh, but it's much cheaper to take NAC than it is to take glutathione. It's very good for the brain. It's actually listed in um, in Patrick Holford's list of essential uh, vitamins and minerals and things to take, substances to take for the brain. Um, and um, But there is an Italian group that has developed an augmented NAC that can denature the spike protein. 99.8% of the spike protein that's extracellular can be denatured by this augmented NAC, and then the liver can clear it out and get rid of it. That's both from the virus and both from the vaccine. Tina, you kindly sent me a link about this, so I'm going to tag it in the description if anyone wants to look at the augmented NAC. Yeah. We had a couple of scenario questions for you that we wanted to kind of go into a little mm. bit. Yeah. Um, Before we go, on, go off onto those, I just wanted to circle back briefly because I know that so many of the questions came in specifically around menopause. Um, and you mentioned fasting and exercise in yes. your approach. And I just know that the next thought on some people's minds will be, well, when the hormones are out of balance and when histamine is out of balance, sometimes um, there can be issues with exercise intolerance or uh, struggles to fast. So I, I was just hoping you might elaborate just a little bit in terms of have you experienced that with patients and at what point of the protocol do you bring in fasting and exercise? What types of exercise um, do you suggest? Um, just because I know a few people might be thinking that. So. Yes, yes. So those kind of changes um, are suggested as well as starting on HRT. So the HRT will help their muscles to be stronger and will give them more capacity for exercise. Um, and, um, and certainly, if women aren't on HRT, without the support of estrogen and testosterone, their muscles will diminish by 2% per annum when they are postmenopausal, which is a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's 20% a decade. <laughs> So, which is, you know, it's quite scary. So by the time they're 70, they might have lost 40% 40 40 of their muscle mass at the age of 70. Whereas if the women are given HRT and they exercise, particularly resistance kind of training is very good, um, then they will maintain their muscle mass and their muscle strength and health, uh, which will keep their core strength, which will mean that they're less likely to fall over and et cetera, et cetera. So it's all good. It's all about being very healthy going forwards. Um, the, um, the intermittent fasting is something that people can introduce slowly and get used to. I, I personally only eat one meal a day and people say, isn't that difficult? But actually it's not. It's really interesting. You don't spend all day feeling hungry. 
Um, your body just learns that you're going to eat in the evening and it'll be great when you when you do, but you don't have to waste time feeling hungry. And if I did, I mean, I haven't felt hungry once today so far. And if I did, I would just have a glass of water and that would sort, sort me out, you know. So I just find that's easier from a lot of points of view. Um, and it's certainly much uh, healthier to do that than it is to to be grazing all day long. Um, and so people can start it slowly and, you know, do just miss breakfast a few days a week and see how they go and then gradually build it in to have a bigger fast and make it bigger and bigger. But I haven't had patients come back and say it's been a problem, particularly. One or two say, oh, I can't because my blood sugars drop and I, you know. But I think when we get the metabolic syndrome is a problem in the perimenopausal, postmenopausal woman and um, that is also caused by low vitamin D levels. So you want to make sure that the vitamin D is in there. Um, and the metabolic syndrome is when they get a mid, bigger midriff, midriff, fat around mm -hmm. the middle. Um, and that is when they get insulin resistance. So their insulin requires estrogen for the cells to respond to the insulin properly. And when you haven't got the right levels of estrogen, the receptors can't respond to the insulin. So the body makes more and more insulin, and that's called insulin resistance. When you have high levels of insulin, that can make fat deposit around the middle. It can push your blood pressure up. Um, it can uh, increase your risk of heart disease, therefore. And it can increase the risk of pancreatic cancer and breast cancer and increase diabetes. So obviously, this we want to avoid at all costs. And taking the HRT, usually women's wastes reappear, their metabolism settles. Uh, you know, they've obviously also been suggested to take the vitamin D, so they, they've replenished that. And and then they're just much, much healthier. Then they feel like going to the gym yeah, and they have the energy. And we like to give testosterone too, because I know that's some questions that women often ask. What about testosterone? We have four times more testosterone receptors than we have estrogen receptors. And we have four times more testosterone than we have estrogen in our bloodstream when we are young women, premenopausal women. So it's a very important female hormone and it um, pushes all the right buttons for energy, exercise, muscle response to exercise, joie de vivre in your limbic part of your brain, uh, sex drive. Um, it also um, makes the... Um, the, the, the erogenous zone more sensitive so when you're touched it feels more sexual and therefore the sexual response is better uh, which is all very you know good for, for everybody so um, yeah so we do give testosterone as well mm. just a little bit thank you yeah I think I guess the message coming across there is that it's a there's a sequence to it and you know yes. there's there's a, yes. an individual approach absolutely yeah. and the other thing is you need to make sure people's thyroid function is okay so that's the other that's the other hormone that we look at thyroid function. Make sure that the TSH is below one point five. Nice. Okay, that's incredible. So I'm going to go to some scenarios for you then. Okay. I'm going to just pick your brain on some scenarios that we've got. Okay. If a woman's going through menopause and she's not sleeping. What's the things that you would suggest? Okay, so sleep is really important for all of us uh, at any age. It can become really problematic at the menopause and the perimenopause because of a few factors. So estrogen affects the, the sleep pattern and also um, histamine does. Uh, and um, so there are a few basic things that we should be all doing at all stages of our lives. And that is going outside first thing in the morning and looking at the sun, like I su suggested before. Close your eyes, let the sun come through your, your eyeball and hit the retina and do that. Try and do that at lunchtime if you can as well in the evening. So this is sending signals to your body to make the right amount of melatonin to say it's first thing in the morning. This is how much you should be making. It's now lunchtime. Make a little bit more until you get to the evening when you should be making um, some to prepare you for a good sleep. No screens two hours before bed. Now, I, I'm my own worst enemy with this because I'm still <laughs> doing emails and thinking I must just do this letter for somebody. And, and actually, I need to reorganize my life really a bit and, and <laughs> practice what I preach. So no screens, including TV, actually, I would suggest. Also, switching off the Wi-Fi, switching off all the electric, electric cables, even plugs should be switched on off rather than sitting on on, even if nothing's plugged into them. And you want 
um, Wi-Fi, it's a good idea to put a, a timer switch on your Wi-Fi. So it switches off automatically at midnight, comes back on at whatever time you think is the first hour you'll need the internet. Um, try and not and definitely don't have your mobile phone in your bedroom. Do, you know, keep it all away. So do all of that. So it's good sleep hygiene. Maybe read a book for a little bit. Maybe, oh, great idea I heard in the, at the Africa Summit. Um, keep a journal and write 10 things you're grateful for from that day before you go to bed. Isn't that a lovely idea? That's a mm. really good idea, yeah. Isn't that nice? Well, when my children were little, I used to do this game with them and I used to say, let's say five things we're grateful for. And we'd be in the car driving to school and maybe they were a bit sort of, you know, tired and and having a little bit of a scrap in the back or something. And I'd say, oh, let's say five things we're grateful for. And then they'd be like a competition. Oh, let me go first, mummy. And they would all come out with the most lovely things. And by the end of it, we all felt so lucky and so grateful and so happy that it was just the most fantastic way of changing your mindset, you know. When in uh, we, we were talking in Africa and, and Zimbabwe and saying, actually, at night, if you write a journal, 10 things that you're very grateful for from that day, and you keep it in your journal. So you've got record of all of your great things you're grateful for. Isn't that wonderful? So you're going to bed with this wonderful feeling of, you know, all's pretty good with the world, even though we know that the world is very troubled. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And actually your little bit of the world is pretty good, right? Mm. So that's all we can hope for, really. Um, so those kind of things can help. Giving women the HRT can make a massive difference overnight. I've literally had people say, couldn't sleep last night, started the HRT today and I've slept, you know, and, and I'm, or yesterday and I yeah. slept last night. So fantastic. Um, the, uh, and the other thing is I have a very low resistance to prescribe melatonin, slow release melatonin. So if they... If having done all that and got them stable on their hormones, they're still not sleeping for some reason, then I will uh, suggest melatonin slow release because it doesn't interfere with your own melatonin production, but it really is important for you to have that sleep when your 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 brain is recovering. You're putting your memories from that day into your long term memory, which makes more space for the new stuff you've got to face that day, which, you know, it's quite obvious when that's not happening because you just can't remember anything. Um, and your body is able to heal. So it's really, really important. Yeah. And then try and get seven, eight hours if you can. <gasps> She can, says, "Can we take a minute just to take the fact that you didn't mention one supplement there? You literally talked about really basic, mm. easy things that we can do that we just resist. Yeah. That we resist. Like how easy? And we do it every morning. Open the curtains. Don't look at your phone. Keep your phone away. Just look at. Open the curtains. Look out and get the sunshine into your into your eyes. It has to be with the open window. Yeah. yeah, has to. Can't be through a glass." Okay, okay. Can't through. be through glass. Okay. And I, I I go into the garden because then you can ground at the same time. Mm. With your bare feet. How how just how how lovely is that just a It's a the most really gorgeous ritual. Approach. Yeah. It's really gorgeous ritual. Mm. And actually some people say that when they go out into their garden and they've got their feet on the ground, they think about their cells vibrating all in harmony. I mean, why not? Oh, you know, it's so not gonna lovely. do any harm, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you and just think about that and think mm. about being in balance. And it's a lovely way to start the day. It's, it's so uh, it's so peaceful. It's a peaceful mm. way of starting the day, isn't it? Yeah. Even when your toddler has kept you up. <laughs> even if your child has kept you all the way. <laughs> yes. yes, even then. Right. Ground and then go back to sleep. <laughs> so another question. Got another scenario for you. Um, so one of the questions that actually came through was about night sweats, mm. anxiety, hives and fatigue. Where should someone start? Okay. So... Interesting, there was hives in there. So night sweats, anxiety and fatigue could all just be menopause, perimenopause. But the hives isn't. The hives is mast cell activation and histamine issues. So um, with a patient like that, I would want to know their history. I would want to know, did they have eczema as a child? Did they have any food intolerances? Did they have um, a history of uh, you know, fibromyalgia type symptoms, IBS type symptoms, headaches? Were their periods heavy, painful? Just try and get a picture of, is this a mast cell patient that we have? Um, in which case then... Um, we're going to have to address that and cautiously start the HRT and introduce it gently uh, because we don't want to increase the histamine issues, like we said before. So the hives is the is the sort of trigger there for thinking more about maybe it's not just the menopause that's causing that. Amazing. 
So I, I had a feeling that was going to be your answer. I was like, she's going to mention the mast cell mm. and we're going to be talking about that. If we people want to reach out to you mm. and want to get in touch, I know you have a long waiting queue at the moment. Mm. Where would you recommend sending people right now? Well, in on my website, menopauseconsultancy.co.uk, people can book in with some of my colleagues and we are we do work as a team. So whilst my books are completely full, I do have colleagues who specialise in menopause and those who specialise in mast cell activation and um, long COVID. Um, so people can see on the website and book themselves in. So there's no need for them to go uh, not, not, not cared for, you know, but to have some attention, absolutely. For uh, people they can do that. that don't live in the UK. Oh, it's there, only for residents. It's only for residents. Only for residents. Okay, Our insurance do. will only cover yeah. us. I get loads of emails from people all over the world and um, they um, have to suffice with uh, podcasts and information that they can glean. But there will be practitioners in their area. There will be mm. functional medicine practitioners. There will be, there are more and more, thank goodness. You know, when my daughter was um first super ill in 2016 there were very very few doctors talking about mcas but now because of long covid it's mm. really put it on the map so that's the silver lining there really um and for the patients who've got me and chronic fatigue they may say oh you know typical we've been st struggling for decades and nobody's helped us but actually it's all the same and so the help is developing for everybody which is good tina i don't even begin to know where to begin to thank you on this <laughs> like are we really appreciate and value your time so so much and we really appreciate you making the journey to come here and sat in our studio and actually doing this recording and if anyone's listening and if they will have questions please put it in the comments below we will link every single link that mm -hmm. tina has mentioned in the description it will all be there you can reach out to her team and speak to them and yeah thank you so so much That's and if you have any final words let us know it's a it's an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for everything you're doing because you're really helping people too and i know from what, what my patients tell me that you're very helpful on the phone responsive and you try and give them guidance and information as much as possible and thank you for that because that means so much to people it really does and i appreciate that tina it's been amazing chatting to you thank oh, you so it's been much. lovely thank you tina pleasure